Welcome to episode 469 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by Blue Wild Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and we have to celebrate Liga somehow, and no one better to do it after a loss, but still celebrate, <laughs> of course, is Rafa Aldemui, better known as Aldemui Football. So yeah, Rafa, lots to celebrate, because of course, from the Guard of Honor all the way to the very end of that Real Sociedad loss, we all knew that it was all about the party. It was all about the celebration. That's why the 89,000 people were there. Thank goodness that Lewandowski scored pretty much at the end to get them ready for the presentations. Because before that, you noticed Xavi took off Busquets and like, okay, give the standing ovation. Let's applaud something. Let's kind of start the good vibes going here by bringing Busquets off in a win or loss. Doesn't matter. Then Lewandowski gets a goal and they're like, eh, something to celebrate, leading him right into the day. We'll start here too with, I mean, La Liga. We have been criticizing you all year long about the ways in which you fall behind the Premier League. What a joke of a trophy presentation that was. Like, and I'm not even blaming the Camp No people. I'm just saying La Liga, like, could you have any less fanfare around the presentation of your top, of your, of your top, of your top uh, trophy? <sighs> oh my God. First of all, I'm very happy that we won the league, by the way. Um, but I do agree with you. And I, and I think, honestly, that's a little bit like that's like La Liga's fault. And Barcelona's a little bit as well. Because if I got a like golf clap, Real Madrid for something, is that when they win, they go all out. And though, especially when they win the Champions League, compared to our Champions League celebrations at the camp, no, like Real Madrid's were way better than ours like those stages like the lights and everything that they did like the ramps like walking towards like the stage it was just phenomenal and then it's just lackluster i think hopefully with the new camp no they got new tech toys to play around with and whatnot and mm-hmm. obviously we win trophies for, uh in order to celebrate but i do think it's just like from a, a, an administrative point of view and everything that surrounds la liga and spain we're just like from a entertainment aspect we're miles yeah. away from the prem and basically yeah. everything and that's something that i think it's just it also has to do with the country as well because then you look at like some like eddie divisa games and then you see like the netherlands national team and they got this insane party with lights and the going on and off on the stadium. And I, I think it's a cultural thing that mm-hmm. they still see like those things like celebrations in that aspect. That is more of like this side of the world, yeah. like America. And I think they, they got to like yeah. turn that switch completely it's, it's all funny, the way. It's funny you mentioned that. I do remember reading um, in one of the, the, the books that were written about Spanish football and winning the world cup and all that, that even the 2010 world cup celebrations that in Spain, the passion for football is not say like any other, but it is, it's, it's top level. There is no denying the passion for the football that's happening, but you're right. Once it gets to the actual celebrations of that football is where it seems to be something. Like that. Now the parade was, was interesting. It looked cool. Like it looked like they were having a good time and they hit all their beats, <laughs> had a little bit of fun. Um, but yeah, for sure. And you know, this is all to say, I don't know what's, the Camp No and Barcelona and what their facilities were able to prepare for that kind of presentation, as well as what was the Liga, right? We don't know who, not say who to blame, but we don't know who kind of put all that together for all those different things uh, and why it was, I guess, had the, the final presentation it did. But thankfully, yeah, the players took their time. They enjoyed it and all that stuff. So, you know, good on the players for being able to like flip that switch, if you will, to go from a loss to be like, okay, but we are celebrating what is in totality of winning the Liga. We were the best team in Spain. Sorry. One thing that, that, that I want to add, it's just, it's just, it's a not a dumb a- anecdote, but it's just one of the things that I do like. I don't have kids, like so. Shout out to whoever, uh, whatever people like whoever has kids. But I, I've always found like so cute and funny at the same time. Like during these celebrations, when you get to see like the actual the kids of the players with the their mini football Barcelona kids running running around yeah and I, I just saw a video which was hilarious to me I, it was at Aujo running around chasing I think it was Christensen's kid or somebody and I I just thought like yeah obviously he's doing it as a joke like running around but imagine you being three years old and at Aujo chasing you all over the camp no I don't know I just thought it was funny like even though like I don't know it was just a funny anecdote that 
to watch like little like the players' little kits and like getting to see finally like Church Stegen. Like I remember his kid was like a newborn baby, and because obviously we haven't won almost anything apart from that Copa del Rey, and that was during the COVID years, we weren't able to celebrate. So now you get to see and like that's a grown five year old kid now. It's like it's a, also like reminds you of like how long ago we won La Liga 2018-2019. So like even though everything was lackluster the celebration, let's celebrate it for however long we can because we can't t take these things for granted. Yeah, somebody have to remind me. I I think back to maybe it was two or three seasons ago when somebody had their kid on the field and they showed the video of I, I feel like he was in the Premier League and I want to say it was a Tottenham player, maybe Son who just kept nutmegging his son <laughs> over and over again because he just he can't he, he can't he can't uh, ever ever take off but yeah let's talk about the 2-1 loss for Al dad because you know it's one of those things where you could easily throw out that match and i think even 24 after 24 hours after the fact you say just like after they were up for nothing against espanol we'll talk about their staying in a second but everybody else the outfield players were pretty much already one foot into the trophy celebration. Like they, you could tell they, they turned off after they went up for nothing as Espanol. They wrapped it up. It was done and dusted here against Real Sociedad. It, it's odd. because it's a similar thing. Sure. And I've have a hard time trying to figure out what is, okay, this is a real thing. Like how frustrated Lewandowski was. Again, I'm kind of going through all the different talking points we'll, we'll return to, but how frustrated Lewandowski was. Right. And how, if you ask him that that was just a game, who cares? It's about the trophy celebration. He would say, absolutely heck not, because I feel like I have not seen him that frustrated in a singular game before. Interestingly enough, one of those top three that I saw him frustrated in was in the fall. Even though they put Real Sociedad to the sword last time they met, Lenormand was so annoying to Lewandowski. I remember him losing his temper in that game, too. That is just a guy that seems to get under his skin in all the right ways for Real Sociedad fans. And Lewandowski was obviously extremely perturbed from that game. But when I'm talking about, I think this is where we begin here with, with Kunde, because Kunde gets pulled at halftime. Basically, yeah, uh, uh, from that 4 2, Araujo checked out of the game, which now we found out against Espanol was due to a knock at which he didn't play. And I felt like, as I said yesterday in the five headlines, if it's a Champions League game, if it's a game that even matters, if it's even Espanol, Araujo and Pedri likely would have played in that game. Gabi was suspended, but those two are likely playing in that game. So it's got this, again, this weird celebration feel where they're rotating, but they're rotating just with the understanding that we're not going to push these guys. And But but once Kunde and uh, lost Araujo, if you will, and went back over to center back, now he shipped three goals in a matter of how much time, and he's struggling really as a center back. You know, and I think it's, it's even like hard for him because it's going back to almost like lay mistakes where they're so blatant where it's kind of like, I, I know how you feel about Eric Garcia and we can talk about it and almost compare in those different versions, right? Like to me, Eric Garcia doesn't necessarily have actually I'll, we'll say Alonzo instead of Eric Garcia. Like Alonzo has all of these little moments of mistakes that add up to a big mistake. Like for the second goal, I would say Alonzo didn't necessarily do like, something wrong like in the way that Kunde just straight up lost the ball to to Sorloth like he just gave it away for the first goal Sorloth dribbled to him Christensen comes over when he probably shouldn't square to Moreno really easy goal like just awful <laughs> all around for the Barcelona back line but I felt like Al Alonso has a way of never truly being in the right position but not entirely being in the wrong position and not being able to do enough for it where Kunde's mistakes especially in the last two months have been so blatant either the own goals or again, just having his hands get stuck in the cookie jar. And I don't know. It's, it's an odd thing where I know people are like, well, it makes you scared about him as a center back. But if you get rid of these completely blatant mistakes, which should be completely and 100% fixable for Kunde, then I'm I, I not saying I'm not worried about it, but I'm not worried about his entire body of work. If he's able to get rid of what is level 10 code red mistakes, then, then it's fine. Like, I mean, really, like that's what it is. And that's why he's fine at right back as well. So I don't know what it is. Is it that he is over exerting himself or he's uh, really just trying to prove, desperately trying to prove something when he gets moved over to center back? Because we know he's good at clearing in the air. He's really tidy on the ball. Like, he is good on the ball. Um, and when he moves over to center back, it just hasn't been up to that standard this year, which is the position he wants to play if all things are be to believe. And right back is not necessarily where he wants to be, but 
when he's playing a right back, he has a job to do. And those games are of utmost importance. And it feels like as Barcelona's level goes down, because again, we're so sad, this didn't really matter. So do you think Alba, you know, we've seen him give full effort this year. He gave full effort against Espanol. But do you think Alba gave 100% effort <laughs> to defend their second's goal against Real Sociedad yesterday? No, like he's won the league times before. He knows how to do it. So what I'm saying, again, as you get my point, like for Koundé, to sum that all up, I'm not sure if we should worry about it because if he is that bad of a defender that he keeps making these completely blatant mistakes, like then yeah, like Koundé is in much bigger trouble at left back, I mean at right back or center back than is to believe. But I don't think when he has to focus, when the moments actually matter, that he's going to make these same mistakes. Yeah, I'm not at the moment. I'm not worried at all about Kunde as a center back. And to me, I think this is more at, le at least this season of just like all the flip flopping from right back, center back, right back, center back. And I think that does take a toll mentally on you when you're like getting used to playing as a right back for the for the most part and the nuances of playing as a right back, etc. And then you go back to the position that you do want to play, which is the center back. And even though you someone might think well is it that much of a difference yeah it, it it is if you think about it so i think it's it's in my opinion it comes more down to that than being actually worried about kunde honestly i'm not and on that goal i do think it was a cold red mistake and then i know i'm being a homer here but i think like sorloth like pushed him off pushed him off a little bit that obviously mm -hmm. the ref wasn't going to reward kunde because he was like dude you gave it away But at the same time, he, I think Sarlath got away with a little bit of a of a push, and then like you said, like Busquets ain't <laughs> ain't going to save you. Like he's slow as a turtle, so he's not going to be that defensive midfielder. Like an Amrabat might have gotten to that ball, and then Jordi Alba was all the way forward as a winger. Basically, he wasn't even as a playing as a left back in that particular moment. So there was no way he was. Even if he had tried, which he didn't, like you said, even if he had tried, there's no way he would have gotten in time. So I think it was just, I don't know. It's really hard in these type of games, apart from like Lewandowski, which we all know he's still playing for the Pichichi. That's why like he was the only one that actually cared about this game. And it kind of reminded me those but like uh, season where we won the league with Eto on the team mm -hmm. and he was still fighting for that Pichichi whether it was against Diego Forlan or whoever else it might be and you knew the rest of the team couldn't care less about the games and he was he, he was actually mad he was like come on guys we need to score let's go and everybody was like yo like calm down he's like no no I'm still fighting for the Pichichi so it, it it did remind me of those Samuel Eto days but then Apart from that, like like Dembele, when he especially when he got moved to the right, it seemed like obviously he hasn't played in so long. It just seemed like a kid that just wanted to play again, going by people. But the rest of the team, like it, it's hard for me to take anything away from these games because you literally have nothing to play for. Well, yeah, I want to I want to so, reiterate the stakes there because a reminder too that La Real are fighting for that fourth place Champions League spot. And winning three points yesterday puts them now five ahead of Villarreal for that spot. And I, I want to incorporate the Zubamendi talk here just a little bit here. And we don't necessarily have to do the pivot thing. We just got something like, obviously I'm going to have to be doing that in the coming weeks. So I kind of want to put a put pin in that whole idea. But of course, Zubamendi, the name that Xavi has blatantly. And I mean, I said it on the solo show I did last week where it's just like, and the five headlines. It's a bit much like the way Xavi is complimenting Zubamendi. Like it's a bit much here. And the, again, the argument for Real Sociedad, the third time I'll say this, that if they're making the Champions League group stage next year, Barcelona can't say to Zuma Mende, hey, we can promise you the knockouts because they cannot do that. Like we saw, I mean, people are memeing it already, but it very much could be true that Bayern Munich could be in Barcelona's group next season in the group stage, right? So it's like, and then Real Sociedad might have no disrespect, but there's a, there's a way that Real Sociedad get Dortmund, Benfica, Right. Um, or who and whoever comes out of the Czech Republic or Romania, right? Or like wherever, right? And that could be we also see dad's group, <laughs> right? And like that could happen that way. And and Barcelona are back with Bayern and um whoever, right? And then and 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 inter or Roma or whatever. And then we get the toughest team from pot three. I know exactly right. So there's a world where I mean Barcelona's pitched to Real Sociedad, that, I mean to Zubamendi that hey, the grass is greener, don't you want to play Barcelona? And again, a reminder that. Him and Orozabal and Lenormand, 
I mean, there are players that were, I mean, now for the example of Le Mans, he started out with Brest in, in France, but he started with Real Sociedad B team at like 20. They brought him up. He's been a first team professional with Real Sociedad. So I know he's not, he's like a Rahu homegrown, if you will, but he's as dedicated to it as you can be. But the point is like those kind of players and put Zubamendi there too. Guevara, who is one of their depth players. Those are players that want to be at Real Sociedad. Like they want to play there. They're, they're happy there. That is their home and they enjoy to be there. And a reminder always too, that especially like there, it's a little more difficult with Barcelona because it's such an international club, but to some of the Catalan players, like a Sergio Roberto, it is difficult to ask Sergio Roberto to leave. We know that, I mean, you, we, most of us have been to Barcelona, or many of my listeners, I hope you someday get there. When you're enjoying that city and you're like, wait a second, there's no humidity and there's seafood and everything is great weather here all the time. People don't want to leave. Like if you're from Catalonia, why would you want to go? It was always the argument. Like, why would you want to go to Manchester or Liverpool? Like, and I, I don't mean like the clubs, I mean like the cities. Like, why would you want to go there if you live in Catalonia? And, and the same can very much be said of even Real Sociedad. Like, Basque players are proud to be Basque players representing a Basque club. And I know Real Sociedad isn't athletic club, but it's still a very proud Basque club with a lot of history. And so for Zubamendi, like, Barcelona are hypocrites if they say that, like, the Zubamendi, they assume that he's going to want to just jump ship to Barcelona for what kind of glory? Like, yeah, maybe La Liga, but if Real Sociedad is in the Champions League, there is a 100% chance that he should stay at Real Sociedad. Like, Barcelona not having a pivot, and not having set up their pivot of the future years past. Like, I know that these are Kool-Aids and we're frustrated by this. And again, it's a conversation. And who are the, basically, who are the candidates left, right, for, for Busquets? And when you're having that conversation, like, that is Barcelona's problem. It's not what we also see it as. Like, and Zubamendi yesterday was frustrating too, because he put on a kind of performance for a team that was fighting for the Champions League and for a team that he wanted to be a part of that Champions League squad. Because especially on that second assist, yeah, De Young probably got fouled. And I think the ref probably should have ca- called that one back. It should not have gone the other way. So yeah, that changes the entire complexion of the game. But the ref didn't call it. And you play to the whistle. And so Zubamendi picked it up, off to the races, squares over for Surloth, and that's it. 2-1. Or at the time, it was 2-0. Zubamendi had a good game. I-, I profiled the stats yesterday on the five headlines. You can check that out. But yeah, I, I thought he was good in the contest. Um, and again, playing for a team that he wants to play for. So I mean, I, I don't know. H- how have you always felt about Zubamendi? Because as I've told people, I think he is the answer. I understand why Xavi and the club are so infatuated with him. I think bringing him in is like bringing even Rakitic to me. That's what it is. I think, is he an A-plus player? No, but even Rakitic is one of the best players that Barca have not ever had, but he's up there. He's a, clearly a top 60, 75 player. Even Rakitic, like, do it again. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But And I think Zubermendi would be that kind of player, where it's just like, he just makes your team more stable, more solid. He's a really good quality player. That's what he is. Um, but I, I feel like if Barcelona's scouting report, uh, department goes out, they might be able to find somebody. That's my problem. It's 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 the the trans well not the transfer fee the release clause because Real Sociedad from all reports don't want to sell him. So they're they're saying basically if you want him, you got to just yeah. trigger the release clause. And he doesn't want to go. I, I just exactly. want to say it a million times. It seems like he does not want to go. He's saying he hasn't said said anything. All right thing. So to pay sixty. That that's the whole thing. Like you, like I, I love Ivan Rakitic, but he came in for what 20, 25 million euros. So I, I think in the, I'll, I know I sound like a broken record, and I've said it in this podcast before. But everything gets analyzed, taken into account our economic situation. That's why, like my whole Rafinha argument, it's all tied down to how much we paid for him in these circumstances. So it's the same thing with Tui Mendy. Like I, is he good? Yes, he's good. But is he worth 60 million euros in our current economic situation? I don't know because it's, if 60 might not sound that much in our, the good old days, but in the in right now, 60 is not quote unquote 60. It's basically like a hundred. If, we're yeah. like extrapolating things. So I don't get all the I I don't want to say over um overhyped or overrated because I don't think it's that, but again, I'll remit myself. I don't think Xavi as a coach yet has shown this season and the half season that he was with the club that the team plays an attractive brand of football that we dominate games whenever or more often than not whenever we want 
to me, this team at the moment is a team that more often than not doesn't control games, lets games, especially in the midfield, and just the game gets not, what's the word that I want to use, gets all, it gets broken down, and then basically we're trading blows, and we've, we had really good, like, solo players, like, Pedri can break, like, do something and win the game, Dembele can do that, Lewandowski to a certain extent, and then at the back, we have Ronald Araujo, and then Marc Andre Ter Stegen. They're, to me, they've been like the 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 glue at the back. So to me, I it's it's such a risk spending 60 million euros on Subi Mendy for then Xavi to because he hasn't to me if he had shown this season, then it's like hey, it doesn't matter if, who plays Rafinha, Dembele, Ferran, Ansu, Gavi, Pedri. If we play with four midfielders, if we play four three three that this team more often than not, obviously I'm not expecting us to play amazing against Bayern or, well, we did play, I think we played really well that first game against Bayern. But like, I don't intend us to go head-to-head with Manchester City at the moment. But for the most part, I expected us to like have a brand or an ad- identity. If, and for whatever reason, I don't think Xavi has gotten his team to play the way he wants them to. So I don't think we should reward Xavi in our current situation with a 60 million player that we don't know a hundred percent sure that he's going to be like you said an a plus player he's going to be really good yeah but for 60 right now i'm expecting an a plus player well, so i'd it's, rather spend it's it's 20 window it's uh-huh. transfer window desperation though because i think if barcelona i and this is gonna be a hard pill to swallow but you're not going to, not even replacing Busquets, but I, due to the number of games that he started and the essential function that he has next to De Young, I think there is a world very easily where whatever player comes in next to De Young does not bring the best out of him the way that Busquets did, one, and B, may not even be able to do that job of being that pivot in a game. I mean, again, the argument about the control and Xavi system is totally fair. Like, there is a player, I mean, again, the positive half class full, that would be there. the player does come in and does some of those things maybe better than Busquets. But there is more likely to me, maybe I'm being uh, cynical about this, but there is more likely the, again, the circumstance where even if a player comes in and I mean, it's just like, we'll use Amrabat, for example, let's see, he gets all these tackles and is sliding in and, Oh, look at how hard he fights. Look at Barcelona's defense is just a good, what was last year. He's so mobile, all these different things. And he shuttles the ball side to side. He can do these, these little jobs, right? But there is a world where Amabat comes in and we're like, okay, that feels good. That player individually feels good, but the system itself can even suffer where there is more variance in De Young's performances, where he's not, again, next to Busquets, where especially when Barcelona high, flying high from January to March or December to March when the World Cup came back and they were looking good. And I, I think there's a world where De Young struggles next to anybody else because Busquets is gone. So again, it's a reminder too that the desperation of a transfer window that Barcelona... They should not pay seven, uh, 60 for Zubamendi, but are they feeling like they are forced to pay $60 million to do the best that they possibly can to replicate what Busquets even gave them this year? Right? I don't, think, how we much should. Of- I don't, I don't think we should. I'm sorry. But, and to me, that's the whole point. I may be wrong, and then we'll, we'll be talking about this in a year's time, and I'll admit it. I, I, I was wrong. I have no problem with admitting I was wrong. But I think that that is our problem trying to, quote-unquote, find somebody that kind of-ish resembles what Busquets brought. And again, Busquets is a unicorn. We're never going to see anything even like it. And Sui Mendy, yeah, he might, quote-unquote, like fill the characteristics a little bit of Busquets. But in my opinion, even like we, we haven't had prime Busquets in, I think, like five, six years, like in Europe. So to me... The problem with Busquets, even though, yeah, in the league, he was good enough to get us by more often than not. Often than not, But when the big, big games, whether it was against Real Madrid or against a big team in the Champions League or even in the Europa League against Manchester United, when the pace just picked up and it was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the other team, let's face it, like, a lot of teams, they, they've lost respect for Barcelona. So they press up high. We can't get the ball out from the back. And then it's just basically a, a, a you're like, it's, it's like a boxing contest where you're just trading blows. 
and that physical physicality, the, the the just how quick everything goes, and Busquets in those big games. How many times have we been talking? Whether it's you here, me on my YouTube channel, on Twitter, or wherever that might be, after a big European game, where in prime Busquets just seemed that slow, like step off, slow, like the game just went like against the Liverpool, things like that, where Busquets just was like, I can't do this anymore at this pace. Yeah, let me, so, let me, yeah, let me agree with you because 100%, because I think Busquets, believe it or not, there is an, I think people on social media have argued that he is leaving too late, that he didn't leave at the right time, two or three years too late. But I disagree. I think Busquets is actually leaving at the best time because I've made the argument that there was still very much that you could get out of Busquets next year. And there was an argument that even if you brought in Amrabat to be the successor to Busquets, that Busquets was still going to start those games. Like, m maybe he doesn't start in the Champions League. I don't know, though, because I think he does still start more next season than Amrabat, even if Amrabat was brought in for $20 million. Because Amrabat is pushing, so you'd expect that they're going to get him for 15 to 20 instead of 25 to 35, which is what Fiorentina is asking. But if the, if, the, if the player is putting pressure on his club then you'd expect that that number is going to be a little lower. So if you're getting $15 million for Busquets' successor for the next two to three seasons, he's 26 or whatever, and then you reset when he's 30. or You know what I mean? You try not, you, hopefully you don't have to give him a huge contract when he's 30 or the next one for, for Amabat. Um, but yeah, in the case of Busquets, I actually disagree with him. I think I totally, again, agree with what you were saying about the Champions League. It was a twilight. And again, it's on the club for not preparing how to replace him before this time, right? And mm -hmm. I think that, again, going through La Liga, that he was good enough in ways that Modric and Cruz were not as pillars of legends of their clubs to help Barcelona win the Liga. And I, I'm not saying that Barcelona won because of Busquets. I'm saying that to win the Liga, you've got to show up week in and week out. And a player like Lewandowski, while he also crumbled in European nights, and there are times when we said, gosh, dang, that guy looks 35 and not in the complimentary 35 kind of way. He looked 35. Uh-oh, what's happening here? But yet Lewandowski and Busquets showed up for you as veterans, as guys who know how to win league titles. And yep. that is what Busquets did. And I think more than anything else, I know very much the same thing with Messi when he was a captain. You're like, what are you actually losing with him as a captain? Because it doesn't feel like those guys are those rah-rah captains. But Busquets, there's a consistency about him and a consistency about his professionalism that allowed his team and his teammates to show up enough to win a league title. That's why I always respect league titles. It's just so hard, especially the way money is now in football. It's really easy if you're not, well, Barcelona and Real Madrid, it's those two. But if you're in any other league, if you slip up for a moment, the big pockets of Bayern Munich are going to roll past you. If the big pockets of PSG are going to roll past you, Man City, don't tell me about parity in the Premier League. <laughs> they won five in the last six. I don't want to hear it. And, though, and their money is going to roll past you if you are not absurdly consistent in those other leagues. And the same thing is in Spain as well. If Barcelona are not consistent, especially in September and October, Real Madrid would have smelled blood and they would have gone for it. And the same thing happened last season when well, it wasn't actually up to Barcelona last season. Bad example because they were nice. <laughs> but I mean, like two years in, in most cases, right? That if Real Madrid doesn't, doesn't come out of the gates and, and get 12 of their uh, 12 of the first like 13 points of uh, those numbers don't make it, but 15 points, whatever. If they don't get 13 of the first 15, then they know they have an uphill climb. Right, they know that like okay, we didn't take La Liga, and Barcelona are still going to be hot on our tails because we both have ten points from from what out of a possible eighteen or whatever it is, right? To start a game, uh, to start a to start a season. So yeah, for Busquets, I, I, it's again, I'll have to go through the candidates and maybe n mention other names, but we're also going to get a point in where the, the the window starts in a few a few weeks. Thankfully, Alemani is still here, but even with Jordi Cruyff leaving on June thirtieth, it's like I mean, there might be names popping up. Um, you know, every second. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did the Kimmich thing on Friday solo because I told people, I, what are you talking about? That's crazy. <laughs> that Bayern Munich going to let Kimmich go at 29 years old where, I mean, it just, it felt absurd when they announced it. And I know, and the irony is it's respected journalists who was announcing it. But no, it was one of those things where the club was like, ah, oh, man, we're missing Zuba Mendy. We're missing I'm a butt. I mean, does Kimmich want to come? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be really <laughs> cool if Kimmich came? And then obviously, like, the Catalan journalists that are connected to the club are like, club's thinking about uh, Kimmich here. Of no course. wonder. Oh, yeah. yeah. Club is probably <laughs> thinking about Erlen Holland, too, right? They're, they're probably it's talking like, about like, it. They're like, wouldn't like, it be great if Holland showed up ne the next week? No, That'd be really cool. No bleep, Sherlock. It's like, oh, of course they're <laughs> thinking about it. I mean, but one thing I want to say, like, please, everyone that's listening, I know the 
summer transfer window is ahead of us. And according to Mateo Moreto, Gerard Romero, and other journalists, they're saying it's going to be even crazier than last season. So I just want to give everybody a heads up that it one thing is when they report Barcelona have reached an agreement with X player. That's quote unquote the easy part. Yeah. The difficult part is actually reaching an agreement with the team. So whenever, like whether it's Fabrizio or whoever is reporting, oh, this team reached an, uh, an agreement with X player for X amount of years, X amount of salary, that doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things because the actual difficult part is getting an agreement with the team. So unless we're talking about Barcelona are in talks with Bayern, Fiorentina, uh, whoever that might be, it's just smoke. Right. And that's it. So that's why, just remember that, please. You, you should pre-order your Inigo Martinez journey, jersey now. Because oh, yeah, yeah. That's going to happen. He's got a free transfer. He's 31 years old. They will be able to <laughs> register him. Like Those are the things I don't worry about. <laughs> the Inigo Martinez and him coming in. I mean, maybe Kunde has to worry about that, you know, if he wasn't playing any center back. But yes, Inigo Martinez. That would be uh, Martinez. That's like the one name that I would, that I would commit yourself to. Um, now, speaking of the defense of the back line, I think the last little talking point about Russell Dad, we already talked about Lewandowski, his fight for the PGG. But the Ter Stegen thing, if I'm Ter Stegen, I'm so <laughs> angry at everybody yesterday. And that's, and I think that's the one guy. Like Lewandowski had a frustrating day. Um, and I think, again, even the way the team was set up, we talked about the stakes. Like overall, Xavi, the team, like they're not too upset losing to a team that really wanted to win. This is a quality side that has been playing really well. Are coached by a terrific manager, one of the best in Spain. We're playing that 4 2 3 1. They were confident. I know they were missing. Um, Bryce Mendez and, and David Silva, but they still a deep squad, a Champions League caliber squad in Spain. So good on them. That said, I think Ter Stegen, obviously pretty frustrated at, at what happened because even that back line, like you'd still expect Alba and Balde and Christensen and Kunde and Busquets and De Jong to be fighting for some kind of clean sheet. Now, I think in the attack, some of the issues that do we, do we don't really need a gloss on. You already talked about Dembele, but I said it yesterday in the five headlines. The problem with having Rafinha in front of Balde and having Balde play on the right side is that Balde is going to be even more reliant if he's playing on the right to cut in. Like he cuts in on the left anyway, but he's going to be even more reliant to want to cut in onto his left foot to make something happen. And obviously Rafinha is trying to cut in too. So it just got so redundant, so mucked up. Um, Balde, he wasn't even bad. He just can't really impact a game that way. And then Rafinha is attempting to try to allow Balde to, into get a part of that game by coming inside. But that means that now we're watching Rafinha go outside to try to beat somebody 1v1. And we know how well that works. So again, it's just not what he's comfortable either. So it's like having Rafinha in front of Balde is kind of a worst case scenario. But I totally understand why it happened because of, you know, Roberto coming back to fitness. Um, but yeah, do you even want to start Roberto in that match? I mean, I think, again, Xavi trusts Balde on the right side more than he trusts Roberto coming off as the backup right back. Right. That like tells you where everybody is in the pecking order. Um, so and I'm not so worried about that. I'm more worried if I'm Ter Stegen about the way my defense is not caring about that clean sheet record the way that clearly that Martin Anders Ter Stegen is. So just to keep you abreast on all this, the league record currently held by Deportiva La Coruña from the 93 94 season. So even before the time of Super Depor, so they were just entering, they were the S of Super for Super Depor. Um, they conceded just 18 goals and 26 clean sheets in that season. Ter Stegen right now at 25 clean sheets and six and uh, sorry, 15 goals conceded with just Real Valladolid, Mallorca, and Celta de Vigo left to go. Now, Celta is usually, there are usually some goals. That's usually a banger. But, I mean, Mallorca and Celta are pretty much safe. They don't have anything to worry about. Real Valladolid are relegation threatened, but that's also because they stink. So if I'm not going to just stake in, I'm looking at those last three, and I'm like, we have got to get two of three. I don't care if it's Real Valladolid and Celta de Vigo, or Real Valladolid and Mallorca, or Mallorca and Celta de Vigo. Get me two clean sheets. Let me break the record. And also, don't ship three goals in three matches, which is very, very possible, right? Like, they could even lose to Celta de Vigo 2 0 the last game of the season. But if they 1 0 Real Valle the lead and 1 0 Mallorca, he still gets all the records, right? So, so you can still take that last game off, lose 2 0 to just Celta de Vigo, and you're still in good shape. So, yeah, I mean, not much I'll say other than that. Yeah, Ter Stegen's got to be frustrated. But also, I think Araujo is going to come back in for Real Valle the lead, and then Mark Honor Ter Stegen can say, Okay, <laughs> he's here. Let's get it done. <laughs> We're fine. The problem is, and I, I think I find this funny too. It's it's it's, it's quote unquote the problem with all these 
individual awards, whether it's a Pichichi, the clean sheet award, whatever well, that may be. It should, it should be a team award, but it doesn't feel like that. At this exactly. Point. Because then I, it just, I think it, there needs to be a change in the rule or something, because I, I think the essence of it gets lost when there's already a champion. And then I remember back in the days, like the, the, the Suarez versus Cristiano. And then the entire team was literally giving Luis Suarez every goal available. Like they would go on a counterattack and Neymar and Messi could literally score. And they're like, no, Suarez, you take a tap and tap and tap. And, and I think, and, and don't get me wrong, Real Madrid did the same with, um, with Cristiano. It's just, it, it kind of defeats the purpose. I, I know nobody then, like after 10, 15 years, nobody remembers how the Pichichi happened. But if you do, it, it's not the same. Like if you really had to fight for it, uh, while wow. then another year like the Pichichi, literally the last four fixtures, your entire team was the only reason they were playing was to give you goals. So I don't know. I know that they they want those individual awards, Lewandowski and Ter Stegen, but me personally, it's like, I'm like cool if they get it, cool if they don't. And then I do have I do have a conundrum against the Real Valladolid. They're a, um, like you said, a uh, relegation contender against Espanol, who won today against Rayo Vallecano. I think yesterday, yesterday today against Rayo Vallecano. And I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, Ter Stegen. But I'd rather have Valladolid stay up and Espanol go down but they're, than they're have both, your record. They're both in relegation zone right now. It's Valladolid, exactly. Espanol, and Elche all there together. Elche's right. gone, exactly. Oh, well, they're so, right. But they're, they're, I'm saying there's a world of Valladolid and Espanol both. And, yeah. they're both they're both there, but yeah, and then Hadafe is right above them. So yes, of we're you just you <laughs> hope that it's yes that Espanol is one of those three teams, and then whether it's Hadafe or via the lead, and it seems like Cadiz is probably safe at this point. Celta's at thirty nine, so they are mathematically still technically they could drop, but I don't see that happening at this point. I think Celta is going to get just enough. Same thing with Amarita at thirty nine. Even Valencia is up to forty after that win. Yeah, today. after Real, they beat Real Madrid, I think they're they're when, not mathematically safe, but I think yeah. they're. Exactly. Basically safe. Yeah. Enough. So, which actually does bring us to the end of the show. Just two quick things here. The Vinny Jr. situation, speak of that Valencia win of Real Madrid, kind of puts sour taste in their mouth. Um, not only in sour taste, but like even Valencia is winning, I'm saying, of that match. It just puts a sour taste in their mouth. It's like, does Real Madrid deserve to win a game? Well, I mean, yeah, when, 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 when garbage like that happens. But I think for anyone who's listened to my show for any bit of eight seconds over the last six years knows where I stand on this kind of stuff. Um, there's no nuance. There's no like apologetic nothing. Like if, like you can't, you can't speak regardless of how he's provoking you. Like he could say whatever you want, but you and I, Rafa, we're talking about this on air. There are a million other profanities and obscenities. Like, like I, I could, I mean, I could tell you around my own home. I don't have the nicest mouth when I get frustrated with things. People know in the office. I, I don't even have a temper. I just <laughs> under my breath. Like I, I'm, a, I'm a video editor. Like I. I, I get frustrated with Photoshop and crashing Premiere Pro like, quite <laughs> often. So I have a, a, a myriad of, of profanities that I, that I whisper at work. But like, it's so easy not to just say the racist thing. Like, like Vinny Jr. is a lot of things. He's a player I do not like. He's a, again, he's a jerk. He's a whatever. He's a lot of things, especially in Spanish. Like, it's a colorful language. Find something else uh, that's other than his race, because that is not the problem with Vinny Jr. He's provoking you, and he's annoying for a billion other reasons. Then it have nothing to do with the way he was born, where he was born, who his family is, whatever. Like, it does not matter. Like, if, if your inclination is to say the racist thing, that A, you're racist, and B, like, get out of football. Like, you, you, don't, you don't deserve to be in the stadium. Like, with the ticket price the way they are, like, yeah, get those, those, those buffoons out of the stadium and give those season tickets to somebody who deserves it. Find a 12-year-old at your nearest club shop that are just walking in, hand that season ticket to that guy. Like, just ban them. Like, I'm serious. Like, if you find it, like that viral video that went, I mean, the, yeah, the video that went viral that obviously pushed back on what they were actually saying was like, oh, we were just saying this other thing. No, you were, you were saying the thing we, we know you're always saying. But if, you know, and, and then every, every person you identify, find their seat, find the season ticket, and they're gone. Like, just that, that's it. Like, they're banned. And again, give, I mean, maybe even, yeah, donate your season ticket to somebody who deserves it. Um, you know, buy, find, make new fans that way. Fans who aren't like this. So it's like, I don't know. I, I there's no nuance to me. Just like don't be an idiot. Like or not even an idiot. Don't be a racist. That and that's that's the point. Like if like being like saying that somebody is provoking you is not a 
what's the word that I want to use, doesn't justify you then saying something racist to that person. Like you said, there's a million curse words that apply to everyone. You literally call him an SOB. And that applies to everyone, yeah. whether you're black, you're white, you're Latino, you're Asian. It doesn't matter. So you're not like that. That is a generic yeah. abuse. If your first thought, and we talked about is uh, about this off off stream. If the first thing that comes to mind when Vinicius is quote unquote provoking you is to be to call out the color of his skin, the newsflash, you're racist because he the color of his skin has nothing to do with him. If he's provoking you, again, there's a bunch of generic insults that you can utter at him that don't have anything to do with the way he looks. So that's the whole point. Sadly, now we're seeing it with Benicius at, at Barcelona. This is obviously a Barcelona podcast. We've seen it with Neymar, with Dani Alves, with Ed Samuel Eto back in the day against Real Zaragoza when he wanted to leave that game. And I think he should have, and the entire team should have left the pitch. Mm -hmm. But Ronaldinho, with basically, like, sadly in Spain and in Europe in general, Italy, and things like that, racism is still a thing in 2023. I've lived in Spain for a few years, and it's the ugly truth. I'm from Puerto Rico. I'm not, to me, the way I was brought up and I grew up here, to me, whether you're white, whether you're black, my dad is black, was black, my mom is white. When I was growing up as a kid, like it, sometimes I was the only white kid in my basketball team, my soccer team. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I was with a group and a friend of mine was the only black guy. And then you got families here for Christmas and you, we take a family photo and you might see someone that looks like me and someone who looks like Vinicius and we're cousins. So to me, that's never like, To me, that that's why it bothers me because the what like especially I I the way I was raised like that's race is not a thing like it doesn't yeah. matter what color you are and then obviously whether like where you're from whether you're Latino whether you're from Africa whether you're wherever you are so sadly in Spain I did like friends of mine they would not say the M word but the way they would like just like nonchalant talk about oh that color a person of color i was like to me it was like a cultural shock because i wasn't used to that yeah and that wasn't cool with me but what i'm trying to get at is sadly to me it's it's a cultural thing in in, in spain and yeah still in 2023 they they see people of color not more often than not not as their own like if somebody's black and from spain like Iñaki Williams, Nico Williams, and things like that. It's it's the exception. They see it as an exception. Yeah. Like to them, the norm, if you're from Spain, you're white. And then if you're from color, you're from Morocco, you're from Africa, yeah. and things like that. So sadly, it doesn't surprise me, but I do think that La Liga or the Spanish government, they got to make something up to be more severe with people who are caught red-handed being racist in football stadiums. You got cameras all over the pitch yeah. during the Espanol Barcelona game. You literally caught the guy that took down your camera and you followed him for a good five minutes mm -hmm. because that was your camera. So the people in charge at Media Pro or by ex -comp uh, the, where I used to work in Barcelona, if they want to, you can literally, the director, hey, camera guy Dan or camera guy Rafa, Literally move your camera, zoom in on that guy, and we have him red-handed. And then it's down to the government it's, it's to easy. create. Code, right. Take the time code. Like, I mean, yeah. again, you and I worked on behind the scenes on that kind of stuff. Yeah, you you find it in the camera. It's not even like you have to follow him. Like, you literally find it, time code. You know exactly where to go back to. You only need five seconds of footage. Or exactly. Whatever. Find the seat, find the location. Um, and then yeah. the government has to create... I don't know if it's laws, whatever they might, they might be called, so that when that happened, it's just not a slap on the yeah, wrist I mean, I mean, for I that person. Even even just the sporting organization, just the RFEF, like just needs to um, better police that. And to, I mean, the punishments just have to be harsh enough. Like that's what I always say. Like you just punishments, like it has to be like you have to treat it as if it's a crime that is like, yeah. it's befitting of a crime. 
Um, and you know, I also don't like. I know people have said to me before when I've done this thing, but it's like. I live in America, right? And I know I have an international audience, so I'm not going to throw stones in this glass house. Like I, I, I don't speak a lot about that, but but I did grow up in a part of the U.S. that there were people all look the same, and so for me and the way that my friends grew up, like I, I can only assume, like I again, I don't remember well, but I, I can only assume growing up where I didn't know anything. I I only saw the people around me, and I probably said things that not only am I not proud of, but I had to learn through exposure things that are different. Then I moved to New York and. I mean, I surrounded myself with people that were all different and that looked all different. And to me, it was just, it was so easy just to say like, well, what, what is upsetting to them? And I, I learned all those things firsthand. Not fortunately for me, it wasn't by saying those things myself, but just by seeing like the things mm-hmm. that upset them and then saying, okay, that exposure to these people. But I talked to people that I grew up with still, right. That they have never had that same exposure because they didn't leave. They stayed. And yeah. so they still talk in a certain way. They still talk the way they talk in Spain, um, you know, except in, 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 in Appalachian yeah. English. But like, so it's just, it's just, it's a lot of its exposure. And as you mentioned, like it's, it's culture. And I think the issue too, for, for sport fans in particular, where, uh, you know, I, again, I love basketball and I do this whole thing where it's just like, how can you watch these players and these spectators and not like, want to have you talked about kids before how do you not want your kids to want to emulate every one of those players like the best winger in spain this year was vinicius jr i hate that fact true <laughs> he's irritating but also he's yeah but good. he's really good and he deserves that and but in the same way like why would you not want your kid to want to like emulate the best winger in spain like why would you not want that like even if he's plays for the opposition or whatever it is like that's a player you want to watch you want to emulate but Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, and then real quick, I'm I, I'm gonna add this. Like, some people are like, "Oh yeah," like then, like he was getting racist chants when he was getting out of the bus, even before the game started. Yeah. So that like, oh, he he was like telling like the fans like, "Oh, you're going to the second division and things like that, dude." If I was getting racially abused, if I was him, or basically I'm Latino, like I lived in the U.S. Thankfully, I lived in a part in Connecticut where I more often than I never had a an encounter with it. Just one time that somebody literally yelled like, go, "Like this is America!" Like go 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 mm-hmm. back to where you, where where you came from. We speak English here. And that one time, I was shook because I wasn't expecting that in Connecticut. But if I hadn't been shook that time, like I can't like. If you're being racially abused or like a xenophobic comments and things like that, like that's that. If I was in Vinicius's shoes, like t- that would be the the the, the like PG thirteen what the thing that he's doing. So like, just just have that in mind. Like when you're being racially abused, like oh my, well he, he told the team like uh, the fans like oh you're going to the second division. Yeah, after he got literally racially abused after he got out of the bus after doing nothing after. He got racially abused during the game. So you can't expect someone who's being racially abused to act peaches and cream and like, oh, everything's fine. And, oh, I'm sorry. No, they're going to react and in an angry way. So then you can't go just when you're provoking someone racially, then mm-hmm. that person reacts. Then you can't use that reaction as an excuse like, oh, look, he said we're going down to the second division. No, you were the one that started it. Being yeah, I mean, if, if people were racist, want, if people want more uh, resource on this about like sporting figures and things like this, like I have it, like I can, I can, I can send you resources and things like that. If anybody again wants to just like learn more about these experiences that have been going on for again, it's not a new thing. Like it, it may Sadly, be, it's not. It, no, it's it may be a new thing that we're, the way we're talking about. And yeah, and every every country is different as well. So like I can't speak too much about the culture of Spain, but it's disappointing for a league that I care so much about and a country I care so much about and all those things. Um, okay. So last thing, a little bit of bad news. Um, not as bad as Vinny Jr. stuff. So let's just keep it a little lighter. Madrid CFF beat Barcelona Femini 2-1. I didn't get to watch the game, but I was shocked to see the result. Alexi Buteus with the goal. And the Champions League final now is June 3rd. And obviously, having not seen the game, my only concern from seeing that scoreline is like, wait a second, is this team, did they pull a Jordi Alba on us? Are they going as far into second gear as they possibly can to keep everybody healthy before the like June 3rd? Like, is it that Alexi Bateas is just, yeah, she got the goal, but is she just like slowly finding her way into the matches? And, you know, are they just, again, just trying to stay healthy? And I mean, it is very concerning to lose any match at this juncture. Where it's like, if it's October, I felt this way for a long time. If the Femini lose in Spain in October, 
not that I don't care, but I don't really care that much. Like, it's fine if a team loses. Like, that's okay. Like, they don't have to be completely impenetrable. They don't have to win every single match. If anything, a lot of times through history, you'll hear like perfect teams, if ever, say, Yeah, I'm glad that we got knocked down. We learned a lesson from a loss and that galvanized us to da 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 da. I mean, unless, yeah, maybe this is, I'm, maybe I'm galaxy braining this one. Maybe they lost on purpose to galvanize them to win the gym, right? Maybe they're like, okay, well, if we take a loss, then we'll come out firing and like we'll want to avenge that loss. But I don't think that's what happened. But <laughs> hey, what do I know? Maybe it's a long, maybe it's the long game. Yeah, honestly, I, I, I don't read. Obviously, it, I, it's never good to lose. And then when you're trying to, again, like make a record and then like finish the league, like uh, unbeaten. But, um, but it's we we talked about it with the Barcelona. We also see that game. Like the, these players, like it's when you, well, they do have something to play for the Champions League final. But up until then, that's the thing. You're running like you're with the break on, um, at thirty miles per hour. Like you don't want to get hurt. You're you're not putting it's the totally foot fair. in. Which totally fair. If exactly. You're, so if you're like you have to choose between the Champions League or the title you've already won. <laughs> like which one are you going to choose? Exactly. And that's the thing. So that's why I'm not worried. Not saying that because like we're taking it easy, we're going to win the final. Obviously, that's not a given. It's not two plus two equals four. But I'm not worried about los- losing after we won the title, especially when there's a bigger price ahead on uh, June 3rd, right? June 3rd, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. Take it easy. Use these games as just practice. Alexia getting back to match fitness and and that's it. Just focus on winning the Champions League. That's the only thing that matters right now. Yeah, I'm actually just I looked up their ground here, uh, as in like where they play in Spain and CF uh, Madrid CFF. How crazy is it going to be <laughs> to go from a very small venue where you're basically playing on a non professional field <laughs> and then playing the Champions League final <laughs> in a matter of two weeks. And I laugh at that, but it's also like you laugh because you don't want to cry, right? Because it's like that is where women's football is, where Barcelona obviously leading the force, leading the charge, and pushing it to new heights. When, when again, no offense to Madrid CFF, they're, they're a team that is not funded by a top level. Um, we'll say men's club, first team club or whatever, like a club with a main, a huge men's first team. So they just don't have the resources to be able to even rent gigantic venues and, and stadiums. And da, 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 da. So I, again, I, I always give compliments to the Barca Femini and any club, even, even Real Madrid for pushing women's football to higher heights and, and working to, to take it to, to, to new grounds. Yeah. Uh, they're and- good. They're gonna go from playing on that the, the, that stadium to uh, Philip Stadium, PSV Eindhoven Stadium, which I, I I'm just looking at it right now holds thirty to forty thousand people, and that's so, gonna like, be packed to the gills. Exactly, to the gills. That's that city's gonna be overwhelmed with Wol- uh, Wolfsburg and and Bar So, all right. Anyway, that wraps up the show. We went long enough on uh, a two one Real Sociedad <laughs> boss Rafa. As always, but I hope people enjoyed it. People, of course, Aldo Mui football for him. If you're watching on YouTube. Just click that link. That's easy enough. If you're listening to the show down in the show notes, just click on the show notes. By the way, subscribe, there. but I'm banned for a week because I was naughty again. And they did the same thing. YouTube did the same thing to me after the PK's last game. I literally was because I live stream for people that don't know. I was literally showing like PK, like just crying and they banned me for a week because of that. And I did not know. But I wanted to push the envelope, and I was showing a little bit of like the celebrations. Not even the obviously, obviously not the game, just the celebrations. And I got banned again. But luckily, that strike had already passed by. So again, this is quote unquote my first strike. So I'll be out for a week, but I'll be back on Sunday, people. I, I wanted to post something on the community part to say yeah. to everyone like, "Hey, I got banned again." But I literally can't even do that right now. So, well, for everybody. FYI- for everybody that says I play it safe, I brought on a renowned YouTube criminal on the podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> we're definitely pushing to uh, pushing on the edge. Bravo. <laughs> so, anyway, we're on Twitter and Instagram as well. Close Facebook group, Patreon, TikTok, merch store, YouTube. You know where to find us as well. So thanks so much for listening to the show. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Forza Barca.